The widow's mite, you've heard of this story before, and it usually leads to a sermon that goes something like this. The widow gave everything she had. It's time for stewardship. Can't you give a little bit more? Usually implying a little bit of a guilt trip because you're not giving enough. Have you heard that sermon before? The widow's mite, y'all have heard this one? Yeah, I'm not going to preach it. Because I don't think that's what's really happening here. I think uh, I will talk about money, but never, never with regards to this. Because to read this passage well, you have to read the context. You've got to read on both sides. If you haven't read on both sides of a, of a reading, you really haven't read worth a lick. For example, let's read about this. So, so right before... This happens before the widow gives her last few dollars. Uh, Jesus has entered in Jerusalem, and he has everyone's attention. We read uh, Luke 20, 45, and while all the people were listening, like this is the point at which Jesus has everyone's attention in the biggest city in the area. What's he going to talk about? This is what he says. But where of the scribes, the chief priests, those who are running the temple, they like to walk around in long robes and love respectful greetings in the marketplace and chiefs in the best seats in the synagogues, the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearances pray long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. So he's talking about the chief priests and how they are uh, look, trying to look good while they devour widows' houses. And then next... Oh, look, here comes a widow. And a widow gives her last two bucks into the offering plate. And if you listen closely, does Jesus ever say, go and do likewise? No. Jesus doesn't praise the widow. Jesus doesn't, like, say the widow is what we should be doing. Right? Jesus observes that she has given everything she had. And he has just said that people are devouring these widows' houses. And then we keep on, keep on reading. And we read that um, the chief priest is in uh, 22.1. The chief priests are looking for a way to get rid of Jesus. And in that same chapter, Jesus talks about how this temple is going to be torn down stone by stone. So would Jesus be praising a, a, an offering given to support a temple that is what he's about to have tear, torn down stone by stone? Like, I don't think this has anything to do with, like, a stewardship sermon, like, you should give, like, the widow. What I think Jesus is getting at here, if you read the entire passage, Jesus is condemning a system in which a widow's house is devoured because she shows up to church and she, it is demanded upon her that she pay the temple tax. And Jesus is saying that just as... The, the priests who are devouring her, her household, I'm going to devour their house, right? Their temple is about to get torn down because they are tearing down the houses of the widows, so their house is going to be a goner, right? Jesus is, is making a statement against a system in which those who have plenty and need not worry about anything, they're fine. But those who struggle... Instead of uh, turning to the priests and their, their church and the temple, instead of showing up and being given assistance and help and what they need, instead, they are past the plate one more time and, and their last dollar is taken. So, widows might. It reads a little bit differently, does it, when you read it in context. I believe bankers are a gift to our community. Bank, the banking system allows people to save and realize and prepare for the challenges of the future, to turn uh, possibilities in, into reality. I, I believe that working with a banker is a fundamentally good idea. It's a, that's a wonderful thing. Except when it's not. Who here knows someone who's taken out a payday loan? Anyone? Yeah, the banker in the room knows someone who's taken out a payday loan. That's, so payday loans, right? It feels like a bank. You show up, you cannot take out a loan, and your next payday, two weeks out, you have to pay it back. That's what it looks like. Um, Advance America, one of the largest payday loan companies in America, uh, and in, in Missouri as well, charges just shy of 300% annual interest. And so if you take out a loan for $1,000, you're going to pay back $1,838 if everything goes right. And if you're short 1000 bucks, is everything going to go right? I, 
over at, at Honeywell, where I talked about this the first time, a lady, uh, told, Connie Thurman was telling me about helping someone who went in to get $400 and ended up having to repay $3,000. Right? It's, it's a bank system, right? It's, it's something where they should be able to go and, and get help, but it, it, it is... There are, there are some things I'm certain of in life. Jesus is Lord, I love my family, and, and, and payday lending is sinful. Like, that, that's right where, that's the level of certainty I have about that. As currently practiced, payday lending is evil. Now, payday loans are not something that we probably think about often. It's not something I even knew about until I, I had some people come in and come to the church and ask for help because they didn't have, have a choice. They, they, they had gotten in with payday loans. And what the temptation was, as the temptation is every time someone comes for assistance, you throw money at the problem, you go, you pay off the loan, you, you tell the person you should not be taking out payday loans, you should know better, but don't take out payday loans again, and then you can feel good about yourself because you've done your good deed for the day. Yet I believe this form of charity is toxic. It helps without understanding. It helps without the other person getting to a better situation. And so I believe we have to listen and to understand. We have to take time to listen to people, to eat with people, to be with people, to understand how people are living. Because what might look like something that is good, a widow going to church, someone in need going to a banker to get some assistance may be fundamentally evil and wrong. But we don't know until we sit down and we understand the context, we understand the story, and that takes time. You've got to spend time with people. You've got to take the time to read the both sides. Whenever you read the Bible, you have, to read every, you have to read the paragraph and everything on both sides. Whenever you engage with someone in their life, you have to take the time to be with them to understand the whole context. What, what, what this is a move that I'm talking about here is a, a, the difference between doing ministry to people and doing ministry with people. Right? And there's a profound difference. Like if someone comes and needs help, if I do ministry to them, it's like here, fixed. Go and, and stop and, don't, and, and, and stop it, right? Don't do this again. And, and it doesn't work. It does, to do ministry with people, it takes time but it honors the way in which they are equally made in the image of God and beloved and, and gifted. And, and that importance of with, I think, is what Jesus is getting at when he talks about, as you've done for the least of these, you've done it to me. Right? There's a with that has to go on. If you want to know Jesus better, you've got to live with people, some of which are in a rough spot. And, and it can't be like a mechanical thing. It's not like Jesus says, as you've done the least of these, and I want to know Jesus better, so I need to go find some poor people to know because I want to know Jesus better. If that's the approach, it ain't going to work. That's like getting to, know, getting to know someone so you can date their sister. Does that ever go well? It just doesn't work, right? It always blows up because the person you get to know feels abused and the sister is angry. It doesn't work. Uh, right, so trying to get to know a poor person so you know Jesus, that sort of mechanical approach, it, no. It, it's relational, right? It's with. I, I need to be with people so I can understand something about Jesus. Something that I don't understand well enough as of yet. And I think it has to do with the way that... Um, People who are struggling in poverty, it's not that they're somehow sanctified or holier or better, right? It's not that they don't sin any more or less than any of us. It's that they are more sinned against. I, this, I believe this to be profoundly true. If you want to find the people who are most sinned against in the society, you go and you look at people who are struggling fiscally, struggling without family, etc. And... Uh, I had an experience of this about a year and a half ago that like just pounded this home. I, I was meeting with family who um, I, I found them because they'd gotten food from a, uh, the local food bank in Milan, and, and they'd dri driven 12 miles south to get home. Working couple, one the lady worked at the uh, nursing home, hard work, uh, and, and the guy worked in mechanic work. I mean, hard-working folks. They had a small child, a mother who lived with them to take care of the child while they drove their truck to work. One truck. That's it. That's their vehicle. And they crashed their truck going home. It happens, right? And they, so, I, I, find, I hear them because they, they need some food. So I, I go down, I pick them up, I get them as much food as they want at the food bank, and they are, they're so thankful, and they want to help lift it all out, and, and that's good. Good folk. 
and they find, they said they're going to need some help getting that truck back. And so, okay, you tell me where you need to go, and I'll go with you. I'll, I'll, I'll get you there. And so uh, they tell me they know where the truck was towed, and it's like been six days since the accident. So we get in my ugly green box, and we drive off, and we pull up in the, in, to the, the junkyard, and um, it, it, it's a metal link chain fence, like three-quarter mile off the road, so I can see it. Right? And, we're tr and we're knocking on the door, no one's answering, there's a phone number. So the guy's calling the phone number, and we're trying to see, and we think that might be it, that truck right there. And he gets the guy on the phone, and the guy says, yeah, I towed that uh, six days ago, and after five days, you can claim a junk title and scrap it. So it's already scrapped, it's gone. And, uh, and then we're looking, and click. What? Right? And so we're looking, and we think we, f we saw it. Like the blue Ford damaged the front, uh, front part, uh, front left tire, and where it hits the tree. And, and there's this moment where, like, let's have a moment of clarity with ourselves. If that happened to you, and your car had just been taken from you in that fashion, how long would it be before you were talking to a lawyer? An hour? At most? Like, the question would not be, would I talk to a lawyer? It's, which one am I going to hire to sick on this child of God who has just stolen my car, right? And this couple, like, there was paperwork in the truck because they just gotten their food, right? And you have to prove who you are. And so they've lost the truck. They've lost their paperwork. And, and, and the guy said, no, it's gone. Click. And, and I asked, what do you want to do? And they said, well, I guess we're going to go home. And, they drove, and we just drove home. It was one of the most awkward car rides I've been in because it was like a dog had been kicked again. They had no recourse. The guy had claimed junk title. It was his. He'd scrapped it. It's gone. Right? And, and I, I, it was in a town 12 miles south of, south of Mile, and I handed off to a, a wonderful Methodist pastor who lives down there, and the church helped take care of that family, and I'd, I'd done what I could. But being with them for that, that couple days, helping them out through this, it is not that they were better or worse than anyone, but they were the most sinned against. And what is the one thing that Jesus received? Right? Jesus was the most sinned against, right? That's the very nature of the crucifixion is Jesus was sinned against. And to know Christ, to know him crucified, to know what it's like to suffer due to someone else's decision, I mean, to be with them that day, I, I, as you've done to the least of these, you've done unto me. And I think I understand maybe just a little bit more after, after that day, right? I believe that uh, to be in ministry is to be with people, and it is only in truly being with them for the sake of being with them that, that it becomes an experience of being the church, of being the body of Christ, of experiencing and knowing a bit more about the suffering of Jesus. And I got to tell you, it is awkward. It can be profoundly awkward. But if we want to be in ministry and service that matters, to follow Jesus and to know him, we have to be with people that we are not with today. And it is going to be awkward, but we come out on the other side of it and we've had experiences of the presence of God in our lives. And so we, I believe we as a church need to create places frontiers, uh, uh, practices. I don't know what it's going to look like so that we can be with people in our community who need, who, are, who need assistance, who need help, so we can be truly with them. And, and I don't know what that's going to look like. Like, I, I don't have an answer for you. I know that last Saturday, 32 people gathered around tables across the street and talked about some of the challenges that our community faced. And, and, and at the end of this round table, uh, eight or nine people agreed that they want to be part of a group that's looking at how do we support families. And of those eight or nine folks, at least two of them, uh, Deb Sutton and Brenda Wright, uh, are part of this church. Like, I don't know what's going to come out of that, but I hope what does come out of that is a way that we can be with people, everyone here, so that when you walk into this church and you say, what are we going to do to meet Jesus, to be with people, we can say, this is how we are going to support families in Shelbina. I, and I look forward to it, and I can't wait and give my full support, and I, I, we're going to do this. But that, that's what we have to explore. How might we be in ministry with people? I want to leave you with one, one last story about uh, being with people, and this, this comes from my own life. Um, who, who told uh, 
with Dana Harvey, and now you know the rest of the story. Right? I have mentioned to you before that I was a street pastor in Durham. I want to tell you uh, just a little bit more about that and where it ended up going. I was a street pastor in Durham, which meant that I went out there every Monday at 2 p.m. We set up card tables and chairs, and we would eat a meal, and we would eat together. And like, I would, we'd, we'd cook the meal, we'd bring it out, and we'd serve each other just like a family does. It was just sort of being with people. And, and we would, uh, I'd be with uh, Nicholas Cicero Mastraco. Bulldogs, what they called him. Retired Marine, he had a back problem. So we started working with how does he get his back problems addressed. And, and uh, I went to, car, uh, went to court with Charlie or Rosamina. He needed to get his license back because he'd been, uh, he got a ticket and he didn't realize it. He was driving without, uh, on a and it was just, uh, he got legal problems without realizing it. It started with a bad brake line and it escalated because he couldn't pay the ticket. And they impounded his white contractor van and all the tools. And so he lost his van gone he couldn't pay the fine to get it out and so he lost all of his tools and I, went, I, was, I ended up going to court with him to try to help the process of getting along and I gotta tell you there's no it's one of the most enjoyable moments of my life to stand up in a collar next to my friend in court because then everyone pays attention because the, sh the church has arrived when oh it was great it was uh so we spent time with uh we got to know people would show up we got no got, got to know a guy named uh, mike and, and he was quickly named a uh, lion mike for reasons you can probably probably guess and uh tony got to know tony tony had the oddest and most intense skin disease I've ever seen in my life. Tony showed up to, for that Monday meal uh, a few months in, and he reached out, hey, my name's Tony, he reached out to shake my hand, and, and it was one of those moments where I'm looking at his hand, and it's covered with like a dry, white thing. It, it's the worst psoriasis I've ever seen. And, and uh, it's that moment where you go, Jesus loves him, I hope this isn't contagious. Right? It, it, it was awkward, right? And you start eating lunch with folks who, who, from this background, and it is awkward. Uh, but after time with them, it, it, we started to have friendships, and we were with them, and we started to have worship, because they asked for worship. And we started to understand what it was like to, to live there. The first winter, uh, you start to, we started to see things differently. Like you, we would go out, like if I was going to jump in my car and go off to school, I was in seminary at the time, it was no longer just jumping in my car and going. It was jumping in my car, realizing it was 10 below and going by to make sure everyone was still safe all my friends, because everyone had their own corner. They had shifts, actually. There was like six corners, and some people had the morning shift, and some people had the evening shift. They would, they'd fly the signs, we'll work for food, and, and some of them really would work, and some, well, you know, people, complicated. Uh, <laughs> and so, we started to live together and live with them, and like Carl and Claude got into a fight, and Claude took a camp shovel to the back of the other one's head, and so they, there were some problems there. But the way they made up was they served communion together. And then when one of them got sick a month later, the, the other one pulled him into his tent so he had a warm place to, to recover. And um, we helped Tony get on disability for that skin disease. Uh, it had to find a doctor who was willing to see a person and not a drug problem. And, and we started uh, getting the churches that we were part of to be with us and to show up. And we had to after, like, there's awkward, and then there's, like, disastrously bad. We had a disastrously bad experience where a church came out, and they attempted to, like, feed the people, and we had to realize that we had to explain this. Like, you feed your dog. You eat with your family. And that ended up being, like, our, our phrase. Like, you... you you are here to eat with people. And that means if you're going to sit down, if the one of them is going to serve you and you serve them, that's how family works. That's what it means to be with them. So if you're here to feed, feed, then you just go home, right? You feed, go feed your dog at home. We're here to eat with our people, eat with our friends. And um, it was just, pop it was my family out there, my friends and my family. And to graduate and to leave was hard. Right. I graduated and left after just shy of two years. And David and Julie uh, kept going, uh, two of my fr friends from seminary. And then Julie had to move on, and then David had to move on, and then Emily picked it up, and then Emily had to hand it off. And, and so when I graduated 11 years ago, I mean, that, that's, it's been a while. And then I was invited back. 
I was invited to preach at the church I had been a part of in Durham, Resurrection United Methodist Church. The church, uh, this is a church that when we had first started having worship, I'd gone to them and I'd said, my friends on the street, they want to have worship on Easter. And you can't have Easter without a meal. And so Methodist women, can you come up with a meal for 25 people on Easter at 2 o'clock and deliver it by the side of the road, please? And I don't think I'd realize how much I was asking. And they did it, and it just like showed up. Easter feast, bam! It was crazy, right? And so we had this Easter meal. So resurrection, they have, they have been, they followed me with into on the street. It was, it was good, right? And so I went back, and I was invited to preach there, and um, that was good. And I had to fund the trip, and so I made it into a research trip and used some professional development money to pay for it. And I spent five days studying how to preach. And you're welcome. I think I'm a better preacher because of it. But the thing that I, I was most looking forward to was going back out on the street. Like, I didn't think that after nine years that the same people would be there. But I wanted to go back. And, and so we did. My, fr my friend and I, uh, Dave, we went back. And it, the, the, the 15501 homeless ministry it, it had changed names. It was under a different leadership. They changed locations. Okay, so we figure out where. We drive up. We get out and we walk up. And we were confused. Because there weren't any tables. Like the whole point was you put up the tables and you ate with people. And they, what they had instead was a long line of tables and they had a group of soccer moms behind it. And I'm not using the term disparagingly, it was a group of moms from a local soccer team. Like, there was a, a, so a group of like eight soccer moms, and there was a line of like 70 folk, 80 folk, uh, going through the line, and they were being fed like cattle, right? Because then they went off and they ate by themselves, and the soccer moms, like, they were good folks. I like talked to them some. They wanted to be there and help, and they, they were doing what they had been told to do. They, they picked up, they, after they got on feeding everyone, they packed up their stuff and they left. And it was like, it was horrifying. Like, it was soul-crushingly hard, because everything I had learned about ministry, you eat with people, and if you're not eating with people, just go home because you've missed the boat. Like, they had, it had gotten lost. Right, and so I did the best thing I could. I, I got my meal. I got in line with those folk, and I, I went and I sat down, and I ate with a few folks. I can't change the world, but in that moment, I can be with some folk, and I, you have my undivided attention because, yeah. And, and Dave and I left that day, and we were distraught, right? This is something that had made us pastors. The first time that I was called pastor and I believed it was on the street, right? That, that's what, this is what made me who I am. And, and it had... Thanks be to God. Like, if I ended right there, you, it gets the prize from the most uh, depressing sermon ever. Uh, it doesn't end there. Thanks be to God, David took me to the church in Asheville where he has been serving. And my friend Dave uh, has been mentoring a pastor, uh, Brian Combs is his name, uh, helping Brian get a church off the ground called Hayward Street. And what Hayward Street is a downtown church, downtown Asheville, and when you go there, you go to lunch, they have lunch every day, and they have these big round tables where people come in to eat. It's a, it's a city, right? So you have a lot of homeless population, homeless people coming through. And they sit down, and the people who have just served come out and eat with the people. And, and, and it's good, right? And then I went to worship that day, and it's Wednesday at noon, so it's the lunch break. And so people from all around downtown Asheville, all the business people, all the people doing the sales, all the people who are like at the local churches there, they're there. They're coming for their midweek worship. And all the people on the street are there. They're coming for midweek worship. And some of the cops, they're there. They're there for this midweek worship. And they gathered together for worship in a room that was about three times this size with no air conditioning in Asheville in the middle of the summer. You don't, you're not in that room unless you want to be. Right? And that was a day they were having communion. And they were remembering their baptism. And, uh, and Brian, he, he knew who I was, right? And so he invited me to be part of worship with myself and, and David. And we got to stand up front. 
And as people came forward to offer them the waters of baptism and to say, we're, we're with you in this. You are part of our family. We are baptized together. We are church. And here's the meal. And let's eat as family. And it was good. Right? What had been left behind in 15501, I, it was hard. But to have that gave me hope because it would... Where I had been doing it before with like 20 or 30 people, I could see how it can be done with an entire community. It was powerful. It was moving and, man. My friends, I am profoundly convinced that the nature of ministry is rooted in the word with. If we're not with people, we do not understand. Right? If we're not with people, we do not understand how a widow making an offering is actually her household being devoured. We do not understand how a person who's down $400 can turn into a payday loan that can devour their household. If we're not with people, we are not following what Jesus says when it comes to, as you've done the least of these, you've done it to me. I don't know how we are going to be with people in Shelbina, but we are going to do it. And in doing so, we will better know Christ.